Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. The right to vote is one of the most fundamental rights we have as Americans. It is the most, this most basic right to vote belongs to all Americans. It belongs to the person who fell ill, to the crack cocaine and opioid crisis, who instead of compassion was sent to prison only to return home, unable to fully participate in our society. It belongs to the incarcerated mother, who was the crime, primary caretaker of her daughter, who has been arbitrarily stripped of access to the ballot box and therefore has no say in her child's future. Uh, it belongs to the 18-year-old in prison for marijuana possession who was held 14 hours warehouse, 14 hours away from their family and a community that they grew up in. And a broken system counts that young man's body in the census where he is imprisoned, and yet he does not have the right to vote. It belongs to the more than six million Americans who were caught in a criminal legal system that is fundamentally unjust, a system that disproportionately targets the addicted, the disabled, and the poor. According to a report by the Center for American Progress last year, more than half a million people are held in local jails across the country. These individuals have yet to be convicted of any crime, but remain in jail because they simply cannot afford bail. Ms. Perez, what types of barriers do people face while they are subject to pretrial detention? Um, there are quite a number of barriers. Uh, some of it is education, where the election officials do not understand that someone before they've been convicted and have been disenfranchised is entitled to an absentee ballot. Some of it is uh, procedural in that others, uh, that it is difficult for people to come in and provide them with absentee ballots. Um, I think it is critically important that we remember that until a person is convicted, they, pretend, they maintain that right to vote in every state. And we therefore need to have measures that make sure that that right to vote is protected. And could these policies be considered a form of, of voter suppression? Certainly, as could other uh, measures that disenfranchise people as soon as they get out of prison. We live in a society where 34 states currently disenfranchise members of our community who are living and working because of some criminal conviction that they have in the past. Well, uh, before 2001, a prison sentence in Massachusetts didn't, re didn't affect whether someone in Massachusetts could vote. So felony disenfranchisement is a re recent phenomenon uh, in the Commonwealth. Mr. Ho, what possible justification could there be to disenfranchise folks who are currently or formally involved in the justice system? Well, I, I think that's a very good question because normally our criminal justice policies are aimed at reducing crime right? Deterring, say, criminal activity. Well, I don't think stripping someone's right to vote does that. Um, or rehabilitation, for example, and I don't think stripping someone's right to vote promotes rehabilitation. In fact, study after study has apparently shown that um, former offenders who vote are less likely to recidivate in the future. Now, it's difficult to know which way the causal arrow runs there, but if we're really interested in reintegrating people after offenses, Right? There's nothing to fear from their votes and from giving people a stake in the society that they will eventually be returning to. And in that one in 13 black Americans of voting age, or 2.2 million people are disenfranchised nationally and are more than four times as likely to lose their voting rights than any other group. Can you explain, Ms. Chapman, why disenfranchisement policies so overwhelmingly affect black Americans? Yeah, so disenfranchisement policies are really a product of Jim Crow, and they were intentionally put in place to make it harder for people of color to vote. And I just wanted to say that, you know, voting is a national symbol of equality and full citizenship, and no one's right to vote should ever be taken away. And that's the leadership conference position. Thank you. I yield the balance of my time to Mr. Ho. Well, Specifically, if you could speak to the point that was made earlier on the Second Amendment. Oh, sure, I'd be happy to do that. So the reason why the documentary proof of citizenship law that I've been referring to in Kansas, the birth certificate or passport requirement, um, one of the reasons why it was so pernicious is those things aren't free. Passports cost you know, close to $100. Uh, a birth certificate can cost as much as $20 or $40, depending upon the state that you're from. And uh, you know, we don't believe that anyone should have to pay a cent in order to vote. Now, to 
own a gun, it's a slightly different story. You typically, unless someone's gifting it to you, um, have to buy a gun. Um, no one sort of has a fundamental right to have one given to you. Um, and so I think it's, it, it's quite an apposite to compare the documentation requirements that someone might need in order to purchase a handgun to those that you ought to have to um, exercise the most fundamental right that we have, which is to vote. All right. Um,